A uh, few quick announcements uh, before I turn it over to Elaine, who's going to introduce today's uh, speaker. Uh, Geo Lunch is tomorrow at 1 in Mulford, and the speaker is Lisa Schill, or Schilly. Uh, carbon Dynamics in Coastal Wetlands, Sinks, Sources, and Changing Distributions. Uh, the IB seminar tomorrow is Annie Schmidt from uh, Davis, so she's newly transplanted to Davis from Brown University. Uh, and she's going to be speaking about mapping life history responses to climate in Arabidopsis thaliana. Uh, I really, everybody goes to the IB seminar anyway, but uh, this is one you don't want to miss. She does phenomenal work. It's very, very, very interesting. So I hope, I hope everybody can, can go hear her speak tomorrow at 4. Uh, the Wildlife Fisheries and Conservation Biology Seminar, Friday at noon in Mulford. Bill Zielinski uh, is speaking. The title uh, of his talk is Making Forest Carnivore Science Useful to Managers. And I don't have speakers or titles for uh, the ESPM talk, Geo Lunch, uh, excuse me, the ESPM talk or Fossil Coffee. I don't know if anybody knows what those are. ESPM is uh, it's a Pesticide resistance in agricultural settings. Pesticide resistance. Okay. Cool. Uh, are there any other announcements? So, Bree, you had an introduction. Yeah, I just right have now? an introduction. I have a student that's visiting from the Netherlands from this semester. His name is Jessa Ahrens, and he'll be part of the WBC community and also part of ASPM. So, welcome him. He's a herpetologist and works on the Where is he? Great. Thank you. Any other announcements or introductions? Okay, uh, Elaine. Uh, Elaine will uh, introduce uh, today's speaker, who is our second student invited speaker. Yep, so I am very happy to introduce Jeff O um, as our student invited speaker. Jeff is a professor and curator of birds at Auburn University. He did his master's work at the University of New Mexico and his doctoral work at the University of Michigan. Um, and the MVC grad students identify Jeff and his work as pushing um, the fields of evolutionary biology in interesting um, and exciting ways. So he's um, published over 200 peer-reviewed articles and uh, has authored five books to date, um, covering a wide range of topics from um, color production and mate choice in birds um, to co-evolutionary dynamics in um, in House Finches and Mycoplasma Gellis. Um, he has also um, written on uh, the conceptualization and signaling of condition in birds, but perhaps he's most popularly um, known as uh, an ivory bill woodpecker hunter. Um, <laughs> because for his, uh, <laughs> his extensive efforts in trying to document this um, questionably extinct species. Um, <laughs> But today he's going to share his most recent work on um, the mononuclear compatibility hypothesis of sexual selection. So, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to your talk. Well, thank you. It's, I guess it's kind of sad. 20 years of work and hundreds of papers, and then you're most famous for going after ivory woodpeckers. <laughs> <laughs> or that's kind of the age of uh, reality TV and, and exciting quests, so I'll accept that. It was fun chasing ivory bills. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, these kind of invitations are always an honor, but it's, uh, it's a really a special honor when the invitation comes from the grad students who've been reading your papers and are interested in hearing more about uh, your idea. So my goal today is to make this a talk that is uh, interesting and maybe stimulate some, some discussion about my favorite topic uh, in, in science and certainly in zoology, which is the ornamentation of animals. So trying to answer this very basic question, <coughs> why do animals have ornaments? It's, it's the sort of question that uh, is, is so basic it seems trivial, and yet I'll argue that this is one of the great questions that, that humanity's sort of taken on, and it remains one of the great questions in, uh, in evolutionary biology. So I uh, sort of uh, tackle this, this huge and challenging question uh, using a very simple system. And I think that's an important way to kind of make a little headway on a challenging question is to don't start with the most complicated. So as much as I, I love to look at uh, painted bunnings and appreciate their ornamentation, it's sort of overwhelming. There's just too much going on there. It'd be hard to know where to start and, what, and, and, and 
where your entry into that sort of signaling system is. But house finches are a much simpler system. It's a unidimensional, relatively simple ornamentation. It's uh, colored patches in their body plumage that range from pale yellow to bright red. It's a classic sexually selected trait. Uh, males have the ornamentation, females don't. And so, but it's, it's, it's manageable. It's not so complicated. It's really one thing to look at and manipulate. And so this is where I started. And I'm going to start actually really at the beginning of my career. And then I'll have much more recent stuff to, to end the talk on. But we'll start back where I really got interested in this question when I was a grad student at the University of Michigan. And, and I really started at the, 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 the foundation. I started by taking up what was Darwin's great assumption in that this was that a driving force in the evolution of ornamental traits was female mate preferences. So Darwin took this as a, as a truth. He never doubted that female mate choice drove the evolution of ornamental traits in many species of animals, but he had very little direct, certainly very little experimental evidence to support his ideas. So when I started working on coloration in birds and, and pigmentation in house finches in particular, I wanted to test this basic assumption. I wanted to start with this as my foundation and then either be defeated if it didn't work or use that as the starting point for, for more studies. Like I said, I did this when I was a student at Michigan. I literally uh, centered my study site on my office in the museum's building and worked out uh, across the campus. House finch is, of course, an urban bird. They're abundant on the University of Michigan campus. and. I did a preliminary field season and I figured out I could, I could catch about a hundred of the nesting males early in the season before they, <coughs> they were finished pairing and before nesting started. And so I designed a simple experiment to uh, test this idea that females pay attention to male coloration. So given that I could catch about a hundred birds, I decided to uh, make uh, a set of those birds less colorful, make a set more colorful and then keep a set as uh, control. So it's a simple experiment, it's just what we needed to test this basic idea. The problem was, at this point in the, the late 1980s, no one had done color manipulations like I wanted to do. The state of the art at this time, such as it was, or only very few studies conducted, was to just take away the ornament. So uh, a few people had worked on removing blackbirds and covered the epaulette with shoe polish, and, uh, and so ornament or no ornament. But I wanted to be more subtle, I wanted to, to move individuals towards the extremes of the existing variation. So I needed to actually manipulate the color and I didn't know how to do it. So of course, I, uh, it was an age of telephones and not internet and I picked up the phone and I called some of the experts in the field that had published on color like uh, Siebert Rower and uh, Gordon Orians and I think I called Ned Johnson and was looking for how to do this and of course they had never done it. They had never read about this being done, so they had nothing to offer. They didn't know any more about this than I did. And this was my first challenge to think outside the box. In this case, it was think outside the zoologist box. And I had to step back and say, okay, the, the grayback zoologists don't know how to do this. Who in our society knows how to change color? And the minute I got outside the zoology box, it was obvious. It was uh, beauticians that are the experts <laughs> in color change. I literally walked down to the Ann Arbor Beauty Supply, and I found really experts on this field. So, uh, and uh, I explained what I was doing, and they got totally into the project, and they they were the good consultants. They knew what I needed to make birds red, to take away color from from uh, integument, and uh, the effect was just what I was looking for. So, when I lightened a bird, I would start with a wild type. This is a bird before I I lightened him. And this is a bird after I treated him with a lightning agent, so I didn't do that bird any favors. But it's reversible over a year. They were going to mold out of this eventually. Uh, and then that's a bird before I made him brighter, before I made him redder. And that's a bird after I added the, the red hair dye. So I pushed birds towards the extreme. Yeah, this guy I did do a favor for. And, uh, and the effect was, was strong. So the, the birds that I added the coloring agent to paired at a higher rate than the lightened birds paired at a low rate, the sham controls were in the middle, and then the time it took them to pair also was affected by the, the treatment. So the red guys paired fast, that's a few days to pairing, and the drab guys paired slowly. So it was 
I also did some aviary experiments I won't talk about, but taken together I considered this strong evidence in support of that assumption that female house finches really do pay attention to male color. And this has been verified in, in subsequent studies by myself and other people. So that I think this is a solid foundation to build on. So this was a really important study for my career. I think it was a, a good addition to the literature, but in many ways this certainly wasn't groundbreaking uh, biology. It was, in many ways it was mundane biology because Darwin already knew this. He, he didn't even bother to get data because he just took this as a given. Uh, females do choose based on on uh, feather coloration. So I just confirmed an assumption that Darwin darn well knew uh, was, was correct. The, the much bigger question, the, the question that Darwin grappled with throughout his adult life and literally was probably thinking about on his deathbed was why do females pay attention to ornaments? This is the, the nut that Darwin could never crack. He never felt like he had a good explanation for why females would assess uh, the ornamental traits of males as a, as a a uh, key basis for making a, a, a mate choice. And so this is really what I've spent my adult career doing once I got out of grad school and accepted that it was driven by female mate choice. I've also beat my head against this, this basic question, why do females pay attention to ornaments? And I think generations of evolutionary biologists have grappled with this study. Now of course there, there have been answers to this question, many answers to this question in the 150 years since Darwin. We now have a relatively rich theoretical framework to interpret sexual selection in. Uh, and one of the key uh, ideas that have been advanced in recent decades is uh, what's often called the indicator model of sexual selection. This is uh, the modern manifestation of, of um, Zahavi's <laughs> handicap principle. I'm not going to get into the whole history of sexual selection, but the, in, the, in the modern thinking about uh, this this indicator concept, we think that ornamental traits are revealing hidden aspects of individual quality. So by assessing a, a, an ornament and potential mates, females are actually gaining important information, gaining, be, uh, are able to make a better choice of a, of a mate um, by assessing ornaments. Now, uh, my lab group at, at Auburn has been testing and assessing this indicator model for about 20 years. This is literally work of generations of students and, uh, and 20 years of my life I'm going to summarize it in about uh, 10 sentences or less and, and it gets one slide. So basically <laughs> what we found in, through all these years of research is that consistently the redness of a male's plumage predicts its performance. So red males perform better than drab males. You say well, what do I mean by perform better? They just seem to do everything better. They, they feed their incubating mate at a higher rate. They feed chicks in a nest at a higher rate. They avoid parasites better. And when they get sick, they recover from parasites faster. They survive the winter better. Um, uh, and they maintain themselves in a better uh, body condition. They just seem to be better. They're just, they, just, they just function better as individuals in the environment. Now, this is really a curious observation. If you really step back and think about this, and I probably didn't really step back and think about this enough uh, over those years of working on this, you got to wonder why in the world would that be true? Why would the, this is a male house finch sitting on a, a, a wire in, in Auburn, and I can tell you that this is a loser male. He's got <laughs> pale orange feathers, he hasn't created many red pigments in his feathers, and I can be pretty sure that this guy is vulnerable to parasites. He doesn't have much chance of surviving the winter. He's going to be a poor performer at the nest. He's just not a very good individual. And I can be pretty sure of that because of his drab plumage. You've got to wonder, why would the pigmentation and the body feathers of this bird tell us such a su fundamental thing about the functionality of this bird? It's really a curious thing, and it's no obvious reason why that should be true. And so. Through much of my career, the, the uh, sort of framework I, that I would have used to explain this is that you get this connection because the performance of the individual actually shapes the production of the ornament. So basically, uh, the birds are run through a gauntlet of environmental challenges. They have to deal with parasites. They have to find the pigments for their plumage. They have to uh, survive and compete. and this, this challenge actually creates the ornament. Success or failure in this challenge creates the ornament. 
So therefore, the ornament represents performance, right? Now, the problem with this idea is that it doesn't encompass all the observations, and it doesn't encompass what I think is maybe the most important observation, and that is in, in many taxa now, it's been demonstrated in, across a range of ornaments, ornamentation actually predicts performance. So without having gone through any of these gauntlets I'm talking about, just the way the animal creates the ornamentation, that predicts how it will perform in a range of, of challenges. That, that observation is, is not included in that previous conceptualization at all. It's, it's completely lacking. And, it, and basically I ignored this for a big part of my career because it didn't fit my thinking. And when I finally came to grips with this, started accepting this as a reality, I had to completely change the way I was thinking about this connection between uh, color and ornamentation. So basically, the way things uh, actually work is that we've got this feature of the animal, this fundamental state of the animal that we call condition, and it's the condition of the animal that both dictates its ornamentation and dictates its performance. So in this way, because they both link back to condition, <coughs> when we color whatever the ornamentation is, uh, is a predictor. Females can gain information about performance through the ornamentation. Now, I'm, I've become pretty confident that this is a correct conceptualization for how things work. The problem is, there's not much here, right? It's three boxes and three arrows, and we don't even have a very well-defined parameter at the top, what in the heck is condition, and it's just vagueness everywhere. It's, <laughs> and it's basically just a description of, of what we're seeing. It's not really uh, a, a predictive model. And I think all these problems with this, with this framework <coughs> come from the fact that we haven't really taken the time, we being the whole community behavioral ecologists, haven't taken the time to try to understand the mechanisms that would actually create these links. And I would say I'm the worst <coughs> offender that there is. I'm the least reductionistic biologist coming into the last few years that's probably ever existed. Michael Nachman was in grad school with me, he knows. I'm a bird watcher, I want whole animals, I would never go in the molecular lab, I wouldn't learn fingerprinting when everybody was going to fingerprinting, I never wanted to touch a pipette, I just do whole animal stuff, so, and, that, and I push the whole animal stuff as far as I could push it. What we've done for a generation now is we have our ornament, and, and for me it's feathers, it could be other things, it could be bird song or whatever, and we, we uh, uh, manipulate the animal, so with the, in the feather color world, we might uh, uh, alter access to dietary pigments. We might uh, give the bird a pathogen challenge or affect its nutrition or do various things to it. And then we get this effect on the ornament. And then we make up stuff about the physiological <laughs> processes in the black box inside because we really aren't interested in any of the mechanisms. And, uh, just read the literature. It's just all of these trade-off hypotheses and stuff. It's just uh, organismal biologists making stuff up about how <laughs> stuff could go on in these physiological systems. But like I said, I'm the worst offender of this. I, I did this for a whole career. And I probably would have just quit, gone away, never having gone beyond this except for two things. One is that I really like answers to things, especially when you devote your life to a question, you hate to quit without an answer. And it really starts to drive you crazy after a while when you're 20 years in and you don't have good answers. And the second thing is, I found someone to help me uh, get into the uh, literature on cell biology and biochemistry. So I was lucky enough to team up with a really brilliant uh, cell biologist and biochemist, uh, Jim Johnson, who uh, has trained in uh, plant photosystems. So this guy, uh, he's a real expert on oxidation reduction reactions, mostly as a deal with uh, photosynthesis in, in his professional life, but he got fascinated by, by uh, plumage coloration in birds and came to me and wanted to start talking about this and eventually work, about it, uh, work on it. And so Jim brought really incredible insights, is my thinking, to this world of bird coloration. So in, in discussing <coughs> feather color, house finch redness and coloration with Jim, the thing that Jim immediately fixated on in this process was this yellow to red conversion. Now I haven't talked much about the mechanisms of redness in house finches, 
uh, house finches and others, uh, well, most other birds, but let's just stay with songbirds because the story stays simple. We don't have to bring in all the other mechanisms of coloration. Within the songbird world, uh, the only route to being red is to uh, ingest yellow pigments. Almost no songbird eats red pigments. They eat yellow pigments, lutein, zeaxanthin, beta cryptoxanthin, beta carotene, and oxidize those pigments into uh, chelated byproducts. So it's a chelation reaction that's catalyzed by a yet undescribed, we're working on finding that, unknown beta carotene chelase. We know that enzyme exists, we just don't know uh, what it is at this point. And this is how birds get red. They, they take a, a molecule with a fundamental yellow hue, uh, modify it, oxidize the, the, the um, pigment, and then it, it reacts with light differently and it has a fundamental uh, red hue. So this is not even close to new. This was, uh, th this is 100 year old story. I literally knew about this reaction in the first hour of doing carotenoid research in the library at Michigan. The first day I got interested in carotenoids. It's just, it's in every textbook, just the most basic biology. But oddly enough, all the behavioral ecologists interested in sexual selection have really ignored this reaction. They've paid no attention to it. They just take it as a given. Well, Jim tells me that this is no trivial reaction. This is the oxidation of a big lipid molecule, big stable molecule. Oxidizing a big stable lipid molecule is, is not an easy thing, and it's gonna be highly dependent on the local oxidative conditions within the cell that does this. Somebody that knows these kind of reactions knows this is special. It's only, only gonna occur in some very specific subcellular environments, and that subcellular, subcellular environment is going to be the mitochondria. So, uh, that's just basic cell biology that I would know if I ever paid any attention to it. <laughs> so, uh, and then Jim got really interested in this, and he actually came up with a specific hypothesis that would link the carotenoid chelation, uh, it would link it intimately with the electron transport <coughs> system in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Now, whether that particular hypothesis is correct or not, the, the, the fact that uh, uh, carotenoids are chelated in the mitochondria is almost a necessity. There's really a, no other subcellular environment where that could occur. Well, this is actually a really interesting thing. Linking the feather coloration of a bird to mitochondrial processes suddenly <coughs> makes this whole thing get pretty interesting. It also gave us a specific initial prediction to test. If Jim's right, this reaction can only occur in the mitochondria, the mitochondria should be loaded with red pigments during the molt of, of these birds. Now, oddly enough, nobody had ever looked at the mitochondria of molting finches, as far as we know, to see if they had carotenoids or not. The, the only uh, line of research on carotenoids and mitochondria comes from the uh, cancer and aging research, and there the wisdom is carotenoids cannot exist in the mitochondria. Carotenoids in your mitochondria is death. There's a knockout mouse that, that doesn't keep carotenoids out of the mitochondria, and those mitochondria die due to the accumulation of carotenoids uh, in the mitochondria. Uh, so, uh, but we thought, well, maybe birds are different and maybe birds accumulate these things. So our hypothesis is that we're now linking ornamentation to mitochondrial function and we're going to test this by looking at the mitochondrial house finches. Now, the um, lipogenesis and modification of lipids uh, occurs primarily in the liver, so we looked at the mitochondria of uh, liver cells <coughs> and we did this in multi male house finches, so we caught young birds that were growing their first basic plumage, so these birds would have fully upregulated carotenoid uh, production mechanisms. Uh, we had to sacrifice the birds, took fresh liver, and then it was absolutely basic cell biology. For us it was like we're doing real biology for the first time in our lives because we're running centrifuges, but <laughs> really sophomores uh, at any university are doing this all the time. So we started working with um, uh, uh, mitochondria expert at Auburn, Paul Cobine, and he taught us in a, in a few hours these fractionation techniques, how you, how you or, uh, separate all the organelles uh, uh, in, in these techniques. And so Paul's been doing this for a long time. He mostly does yeast mitochondria, but he's done human and, and mouse and a little bit of Drosophila. I asked Paul, how many times do you think you've opened the centrifuge lid and pulled out purified mitochondria and, and you know he had no idea he's, it was hundreds if not a thousand times he's pulled mitochondria out of a centrifuge and every one of those times the mitochondria are brown or yellow 
yellowish brown. Look in any textbook, mitochondria are not colorful. They're yellowish brown. Hundreds of times in the whole history of cell biology, nobody's ever seen a colorful mitochondria until we pulled our tubes from house finches, molting house finches out of the centrifuge, and <laughs> the males were glowing bright yellow or orange and red. So these are females that aren't expressing color. They're the typical mitochondria color, this yellowish brown. The male in this little sample that was growing bright red feathers had bright red mitochondria. The males growing orange feathers had orange uh, mitochondria. We took this down and showed it to Cobine, and he was sure we'd screwed it up because we're a bunch of ornithologists for any centrifuges. And he said, I don't know how you guys contaminated your samples, but this is, you, I, you, you screwed up a, a thing you cannot possibly screw up. And so, and we had, it took him days to convince him it was really mitochondria. But sure enough, we, we, you know, there's ways to check. There's markers to show that it, indeed it's mitochondria. And we've uh, analyzed the carotenoids of, of both the mitochondrial fraction and other fractions. And so what we find is that the carotenoids follow the mitochondria. As you do these spins, you get more and more pure mitochondria. As you do that, you get higher and higher carotenoid concentrations. There's no doubt that carotenoids are in the mitochondria. And then you get this really interesting pattern where in the uh, mitochondrial fraction you get carotenoids that are unesterified whereas outside of the mitochondria in the what probably the Golgi and endoplasmic reticulum you get mito you get uh, carotenoids that are esterified so carotenoids are esterified to stabilize them they're not reactive when they're esterified you you unesterify them to make them reactive so where they're being be, where they're being synthesized of course they're unesterified and where they're being packaged and transported, they're esterified. So it looks like carotenoids are being ingested, moved to the mitochondria, converted to red pigments, and then shipped out to the feathers. Okay, well, this talk's supposed to be on sexual selection. I just told you I hate reductionistic biology, and now we're doing cell biology all of a sudden. So where, how does this come back to sexual selection? Well, to me, this got really interesting uh, immediately. Because remember, there's this fundamental question, why in the world would a bird's plumage coloration tell you something fundamental about how that bird functions as an individual? Well, all of a sudden, in my mind all of a sudden, we're linking our redness of feather coloration to mitochondria. Well, I'm no cell biologist, but I knew mitochondria is the source of energy. We all learned that in the seventh grade, mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell. So it's the primary source for production of ATP, it's also the primary source of free radicals. And if you read this literature on ornamentation of birds, everybody's obsessed with immune systems and free radicals. And all, all of these things tie intimately to uh, mitochondrial function. So from all of this, I, I said, I think we are at a point where we could actually make our indicator model a better model, a more specific model. So instead of suggesting that females look at ornamentation to assess some vague concept of condition, now we're saying that females assess ornaments in males specifically to get information about uh, cellular respiration. They're assessing the, the um, functionality of cellular respiration as they assess ornamentation. So we've got some little bit of data to support this in songbirds, but I'm ambitious enough to think that this could go well beyond carotenoid color in birds, and we can at least make a plausible story about how a whole host of ornaments that are viewed as being condition dependent could easily link to mitochondrial function. So uh, uh, song displays of birds, especially the song elements that link to cognitive ability, are, are good candidates for traits that would link to mitochondrial function. If you read the biomedical literature on uh, neurogenesis and neurological disorders, it's largely a mitochondrial literature. Mitochondrial dysfunction underlies all sorts of human neurological dysfunction, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, on and on. Just Google uh, neurofunction in, in mitochondria and you'll hit uh, the hundreds of papers that are written. Uh, protein synthesis is intimately linked to mitochondrial functions of so various uh, ornaments that are elongated protein structures could be signaling mitochondrial function. And then behavioral displays uh, for sure could, could directly link to mitochondrial function. As a matter of fact, Ward Watts research on Calias butterflies already links uh, flight performance in butterflies to uh, cellular respiration. So I think this could be a, a more or less general uh, concept to apply to those, not all ornaments in animals, but those ornaments that are already viewed as being condition dependent 
ornaments. They're not necessarily, condition now becomes uh, respiratory function. Okay, so uh, uh, I sort of got to, let me go back just a little bit because we're going to come to that. But as you, as you think about this new concept, I'm excited about it. It's, it's a testable hypothesis that we could, uh, that we could move forward on. All we've got now is a link showing carotenoids in the mitochondria. What we really need is to show uh, mitochondrial function linking to ornamentation, all these things. So in a sense, we should stop here, uh, uh, you know, be happy with a new idea, a new testable thing to move, move forward on and, and, you know, not push this. But I always like to push things. So uh, as soon as you get into the mitochondrial literature and start reading about this and mitochondrial function, it doesn't take long to run into the concept of mitonuclear compatibility. Um, so, mitonuclear compatibility is a major determinant of, uh, of mitochondrial function. And it's, it's, a, it's a concept I embarrassingly didn't know anything about until about two or three years ago. I'd never even heard of this concept, had no idea about it, and I really was, couldn't call myself much of an evolutionary biologist being so ignorant of uh, some of the most basic uh, concepts about eukaryotic evolution and mitonuclear interactions. I, I really should have been up on this literature. And I was really excited when I did get caught up a little bit on this literature. So what we're talking about here, I'm sure most people in the room are well aware of this, but uh, the, uh, the end point of cellular respiration is oxidative phosphorylation. So this is where 90% of the ATP in the body is produced, and it's where 90% of the free radicals in, in the body are produced. And it's uh, oxidative phosphorylation uh, is, is uh, conducted by uh, a set of complexes in the intermitochondrial membrane. So it's the electron transport system. Five complexes are called complexes because they're assemblies of protein subunits. Now this is a uh, figure out of TREE, a, a really nice paper by David Rand in, in 2004. And he's, it's sort of cartoonish, but it's proportional and it's, it's more or less, less accurate. And what Rand is illustrating here is that these subunits of the complexes are partly encoded for by nuclear genes and partly encoded for by mitochondrial genes. So uh, about 80% of these, of these uh, proteins are, uh, the code for it lies outside the mitochondria in the nucleus. It has to be transcribed translated, then the proteins are moved into the mitochondria and assembled into these complexes along with the local products of the mitochondria. So you have to have close uh, interaction between the mitochondrial subunits and the uh, nuclear subunits where you get impaired respiration and that's essential to, to core function as you get. This is where your energy and your free radicals are coming from. So there's this really nice illustration of what happens when you get compatibility versus incompatibility in the, a bioessay article by Nick Lane. By the way, Nick Lane is sort of the guru of this whole topic. I love reading Nick Lane's stuff. He's got two books on this, and he's got, uh, well, three books if you count his first book, Oxygen. And then um, he's got a whole series of, of uh, articles, including a lot of perspectives in, in science and nature. And in this article, he's showing uh, mitonuclear interactions as circles within circles. So the inner circle represents mitochondria, the outer circle represents nuclear component to these electron transport system. When you have compatibility, and he just shows the color matching, blue match to blue, you get unimpeded flow of electrons down the electron transport chain. The energy is coming by dropping electrons in energy level, and that energy is captured by pumping protons across the uh, intermitochondrial membrane. You set up a membrane potential across here, uh, stored energy, and then that's used to uh, create ATP by pumping protons across ATP synthase, right? So this is, this is the, the core <coughs> process for energy production in eukaryotic bodies. Now when you have um, incompatibility, and he shows black match to red, so the, the subunits don't physically fit together right, or for whatever reason they're not interacting in an appropriate way, then your flow of electrons is impeded. When you impede the flow of electrons, bad stuff happens. The electrons interact with other molecules and create free radicals, so you get free radical leakage. Because you're not using the energy efficiently, you're having weaker proton pumping, 
you set up a weaker membrane potential, and then you have less ATP production. So binonuclear incompatibility gives you the double whammy of uh, reduced energy and increased free radical production. If it gets bad enough, you get cell death. If it gets really bad, you get the total system failure. It's just inviolable. Now, the great challenge for uh, choosing female could potentially be getting mitonuclear compatibility in, in her offspring. So this is my hypothesis I'm going to present. So we think about a choosing female. Her goal is to produce viable, robust offspring, right? That's the whole point of, of life moving forward. So in that offspring, she's going to contribute 100% of the mitochondrial genome. There's a very few exceptions to this. We'll just ignore the exceptions. She's going to She's going to contribute the mitochondrial genome that's going to interact with the diploid offspring genome. Now, half of that uh, offspring genome is going to come from her. That's good because if, if she's mating and what have you, she's viable. But half is going to come from her sexual partner, from the male. There's the potential for his contribution to not properly interact with her mitochondrial genes to create incompatibilities, offspring inviability, and trouble. A female should be obsessed with getting uh, uh, male genotypes into their offspring that are compatible with her mitochondrial type. So, we're proposing that this is such an important consideration for females that this is basically the foundation for sexual selection. This mitonuclear compatibility hypothesis proposes it's this imperative to find a mate with nuclear genes that are compatible with her mitochondrial genes that drives the evolution of traits that signal uh, mitochondrial function and respiratory function. So basically that same uh, figure, we started by saying females are assessing condition, what the heck is condition? Okay, they're assessing cellular respiration. Now we're saying specifically that she's assessing cellular respiration because that gives her a key insight into mitonuclear compatibility uh, of her offspring. So, is there, is there any basis for this? Does this make even a little bit of sense? Do mitonuclear incompatibilities ever exist in wild populations so you'd have to worry about them? And is it something that could drive this? Well, yes, without a doubt, mitonuclear incompatibilities are a real thing that populations, organisms in real uh, wild populations have to deal with. And the sources for the incompatibilities are mutation, every generation, there's a recombining of the mito and nuclear components. Any uh, mutations in the, in the nuclear genome can, can produce these incompatibilities. And then gene flow. And gene flow could be a big factor in, in this as well, because there's, there's uh, going to be population level adaptation. Now, we know this is true because the human biomedical literature is dominated, or maybe not quite dominated, it is, uh, it, it is well represented with uh, examples about mitochondrial dysfunction causing uh, a whole host of diseases, as I dis already discussed. So, uh, dysfunction of the mitochondrial process underlies disease, and there's a genetic basis, a nuclear genetic basis, for many of these diseases. There's actually abundant evidence in the human literature that mitonuclear um, uh, uh, incompatibilities are <coughs> leading to all sorts of dysfunction in, in the human population. Okay, now there's two key assumptions of this hypothesis. The first is what I've already talked about. Indicator traits should be signals of efficiency of oxidative phosphorylation. I already presented uh, my evidence and, and arguments uh, for that. The second key assumption is that um, the, the males that females are assessing share the same functional mitotypes as the choosing females. And this is a, a critical one. So, when a female assesses uh, uh, a potential mate, and she's assessing his mitonuclear compatibility to predict how her offspring will do, the information she's getting only makes sense if his mitochondrial type is her mitochondrial type. His nuclear genes have to be expressed against a shared mitochondrial background, or she's potentially getting disinformation. At, at best, she's getting poor information. So, females should be selected to to choose mates within a pool of shared functional mitotypes. 
And basically, it comes down to if the <coughs> boundaries for shared functional mitotypes are species boundaries, then females should choose for conspecifics. There should be selection for females to have hard preferences for conspecifics. And there should be the evolution of traits that signal species identity. And of course, this is the old, I think, way underappreciated species recognition concept uh, of Alfred Wallace. Alfred Wallace, who was a contemporary of Darwin's and co-published co uh, Natural Selection, also had great insights into sexual selection and um, uh, came up with this idea that um, uh, ornamental traits in many cases signal species identity. I think Wallace was dead on with his observations of this. Okay, so basically what we've got is we've got a need for females to get two critical classes of information as they're choosing mates. The first thing that a female has to do as her first cut in assessing potential mates is make sure she's mating within a shared minotype, within the species. And so I think there's going to be the evolution of uh, uh, unambiguous, uh, arbitrary signals of uh, uh, species identity. So I'm using tanagers, uh, the eastern tanager, scarlet tanager, and summer tanager here as examples. These birds are really similar, but one has black wings, one has red wings. It's a fixed trait. Nobody's ever suggested it has any, anything to do with individual condition. I think it, it really won't have anything to do. It's, a, it's an unambiguous, simple signal of species identity. You really can't make a mistake. Bird watchers don't misidentify these birds. The tanagers don't misidentify these birds because one has black wings, one has red wings. Now, once you've, you've gotten your, your uh, eyeball on the right set of males, red wings or black wings, then you assess the, uh, the condition-dependent trait, the second, cri second uh, critical information, to assess uh, uh, efficiency of oxidative phosphorylation. <coughs> and tanagers vary in, in, in coloration from orange to bright red. You, you choose the highly ornamented birds. So, just to drive this point home, female house finch looking at a flock of finches as potential mates. The first cut is to eliminate those birds that don't have species typical plumage pattern, mate within your species. All of these birds should share a functional uh, mitochondrial type. Then within that group of birds, eliminate any birds with poor ornamentation. Now, you may throw out birds that have mitonuclear compatibility but just are are doing badly for another reason, who cares if you're a female? Every time when you make this kind of choice, you're going to eliminate those males that would have mitonuclear compatibility. You're left with only the males, robust males with mitonuclear compatibility in your pool of males that you're choosing among. Okay, so those people in the audience that are really obsessed with sexual selection like I am, the really, you know, all this is nice, but all I really want to know is why do peacocks have a peacock tail? Why do we have birds of paradise and the most fantastic ornaments? Where does your, where does this, this new thinking get us in terms of understanding a peacock? Well, actually, I think that the existing theory, the 30-year-old theory on uh, uh, elaboration of ornaments is, is as good as we've got. It very well may be correct. There's every reason to think this Fisher, Landy, Kirkpatrick model for runaway sexual selection is correct, and that fits right into the models that we've got. I think you had Rick Prum here a few weeks ago. He already probably gave you a whole spiel on Landy Kirkpatrick mechanism. So, just insert everything Rick said right here. It's moving on, uh, but we can now put this in uh, a, a, a broader framework. That's not the whole story. It's not all Fisher Kirkpatrick. That's a key part of this. But if you look at the, the runaway models, as, as uh, Prom explained them to you, all of those models start with uh, a fixed female preference for an arbitrary male trait. That's where those models have to begin, and then they move forward towards elaboration. Now, there's all sorts of ways that you can potentially get to that, but I say you get to that through species recognition. The, the need for arbitrary signals of species identity sets the stage for uh, trait elaboration. So this is how I see things working. The first fundamental uh, uh, criteria for females is uh, 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 respiratory efficiency, a functional uh, uh, electron transport system. 
that signaled in simple traits like a patch of red plumage, uh, a song that reflects a, a correctly wired neural system, uh, a flight display, or what have you. Simple, usually unidimensional uh, uh, patterns that, are, uh, that resist uh, elaboration. Then as we get diversification and the chance to mate outside of a functional mitotype, you have a selection on females to find traits that um, signal species identity. So this is going to lead to the evolution of small arbitrary differences among species, just as an illustration with a slightly elongated uh, crest feathers or slightly elongated tail feathers have nothing to do with condition in this argument. It's simply an arbitrary signal of species identity. Things could stay here forever, and they seem to do this in a lot of birds, but this sets, sets the stage potentially for a fisherian process to then pick up those arbitrary traits and elaborate them into peacock's tails uh, or, or what have you. Um, so basically we got two classes of ornaments. We've got our indicator trait, which resists elaboration and tends to persist across uh, taxonomic uh, uh, cladogenesis. And then we've got our arbitrary signals of species identity, which are prone to be elaborated through a fisherian process. Now, obviously I'm excited about this idea, uh, mostly because for the first time in my career, I can flip open a bird book and look at a set of ornamented taxa and articulate a plausible explanation for how that diversity exists. And it's been a lifelong uh, frustration for me that I could not even articulate a reasonable explanation for diversity of bird plumages until just a couple years ago. When you work on something for 20 years, you should at least be able to come up with some explanation for it. The best I had until about three years ago was it's all condition dependent and somehow a little curly tail and this bird shows condition better than a greenish tail and believe me I beat on that so long I can tell you for sure it's nonsense. It can't, you cannot explain this by nuances of condition. If we look at the jungle fowl, so these are uh, four to seven depending on your species concept, jungle fowl in Southeast Asia, what you see is this elaboration of, of body plumages and tail feathers that are that do not reflect individual condition and we know from experimental work by Ligon and Thornhill and Zuck that females don't pay attention to subtle differences in the plumage traits it doesn't relate to parasite resistance or any uh, measure of condition what does reflect condition in jungle fowl are the wattles and combs the soft parts and these are excellent measures of condition. These reflect parasite resistance and everything we think of with regard to condition. I'm sure they're going to reflect uh, cellular respiration when, when those experiments are done. But if we look at the, the plates of jungle fowl, that trait remains constant across all of these speciation events. The, 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 the body plumage is, is evolving all over the place randomly, I think by a Fisher process, but the, the, the core indicator of respiratory efficiency uh, remains the same. So at least we can now propose an explanation for diversity of colors. We've got signals of, uh, of <coughs> respiratory efficiency and then we've got signals of species identity which are prone to be elaborated by a Fisher process. So I call this the dual nature of animal ornamentation. I think that for too long in the world of sexual selection we've been in camps, almost like football teams, like oh, I cheer for the condition team or I cheer for the Fisher team and you always bend things around to be to be on your side and it's been really counterproductive. If we start to look across taxa and think that there's indicator traits that are signaling one thing and traits for species identity elaborated through Fisher process that do something else, it all starts to make sense, the literature makes more sense and we can look at our bird books and and have some idea what we're looking at. So with that, I will be happy to take questions and hear what people think about